I'm just delighted to be here. When I looked at the speakers that uh, have been brought together for this 10-day symposium and conference, I had the impression that this was the Parthenon of experts and leaders that are trying to help us to understand, to broaden our understandings, and to have more clarity of how we should live. So I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm also humbled to be part of this program. And uh, we are all becoming more and more aware that what we need today more than anything else is better education, more inspiration, and a clearer motivational content. Let me just read something to you. <clears throat> the village well was poisoned and people fell sick. The doctors, nurses, villagers all ran about buying new beds, giving new medications, providing lifelong care for those permanently crippled or diseased. They became very adept at treating the ill. They refined the medicines. They discovered new and stronger antidotes. They trained people to care for the sick. They built beautiful buildings to accommodate the chronically ill. Better treatment procedures were invented with marvelous marvelous mechanical devices. Emergency services were developed to a remarkable degree of efficiency. There never had been better medical care anywhere, except the people, the patients, kept coming and coming and coming. And the statistics kept rising and rising and rising because no one treated the source of the problem, the poison well. We believe that today our culture represents a poison well. Our culture does not encourage people to be healthy. Even our medical care system is not a health promoting one. It's basically a, basically a disease managing system managing symptoms but not attacking the causes. And this is very, very mm, of great consequence for all of us as a society because our modern killer diseases are largely lifestyle related. They're behaviorally oriented. And yet we treat these behavioral problems with a mechanistic, pharmacological, procedure-oriented approach without being able to affect in most of these chronic diseases any lasting cure. We're just managing, managing the symptoms. What we need is a more educational approach to these kind of problems such as diabetes and heart disease and uh, high blood pressure, arthritis, and of course, today's topic, obesity. What can we do about this problem? What I want to do in the next 90 minutes, I want to give you just a slim view of a broad subject. Because we could spend all day, all 10 days, on the complexity of obesity. What I want to do is I want to boil it down to some of the basics and to give you some ideas what we can do. And if you follow these kind of guidelines, you have an exceptional chance of not becoming drained by all the propaganda that's out there, where all kinds of this, things are being offered to us, when the answers are oftentimes much, much simpler. Just a couple of years ago, a very powerful book was published by a Pulitzer Prize winning author, Michael Moss. And it starts like this. In the spring of 1999, the heads of the world's largest processed food companies from Coca-Cola to Nabisco gathered in Minneapolis for a secret meeting. On the agenda, the emerging epidemic of obesity and what to do about it. Now, you see, increasingly, the salt and sugar and fat-laden foods these companies produced were being linked to obesity. And a concerned Kraft executive took the stage to issue a warning. Kraft Foods. Kraft Foods had just been acquired by Philip Morris, the tobacco giant. And this executive was concerned because he had the idea that now that we're belonging to the tobacco industry, I know what happened to them. 
because they know how to addict people. They know how to habituate people. They know how to put out the allures. What happens now as perhaps we become subject to the same process? And he said, as he took the stage, he said, there would be a day of reckoning unless changes were made in the industry. This executive then launched into a damning PowerPoint presentation, making the case that processed food companies could not afford to sit by idle as children grew sick and class action lawyers lurked on the sidelines. You see the content? To deny the problem, he said, was to court disaster. Eleven of the most powerful CEOs in the processed food industry had come to meet there. They'd come in with their private jets, a secret meeting, taking care of 700,000 employees with revenues of over $300 billion, powerful men, tycoons of industry. They wanted to have a secret meeting to decide what shall we do. The keynote address was given. We need to deal with the problem. But the message, I think, was too clear and too direct because when he was done, the most powerful person in the room, the CEO of General Mills, stood up to speak. He was clearly annoyed. He was very upset. And by the time he sat down, the meeting was canceled. What do you think this man said to his powerful colleagues in the business? Think about it. We'll come back to that in just a few moments. Meeting canceled. Traveling home again. What happened? <clears throat> so we want to spend some time to perhaps talk about the obesity epidemic that we face in our society today. It's very interesting. When you look at the size of the chairs over time in this country, <laughs> the chairs were always pretty much the same size. And then something happened very recently where all of a sudden the size expanded and people told me, you don't understand. The reason for this enlargement is because they had surplus lumber in the Northwest and they had to use it up. <laughs> really? I was on the airplane at 737. Every seat was taken except one right next to my seat. And I was kind of happy about this. I could spread out a little bit. It was a long flight. And then they opened the door one more time. And a man came in like this. And I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> now, I have, I have nothing against people that are struggling with overweight. As a matter of fact, I care about these people. I deeply care about these people. But it was a matter of adjusting my attitude at that moment. I had different expectations. I had to make a mental shift. I knew I would have a very warm side around my body. And so I, I was, I'm a gentleman most of the time. And so I got out of my seat and I even lifted the uh, armrest so that this gentleman could get and find his seat right next to my seat. And he just wedged himself into the seat and under his breath he said, isn't it terrible they're making these seats smaller every year? <laughs> I was very nice. I didn't say anything. We became friends in the process of the flight. I showed this um, picture at a convention some time ago. There were some thousand people there and um, it was very interesting that one man raised his hand and he said, my wife is an antique collector. I, I, would you object if I leave the auditorium here and I call my wife because I want her to check out and measure these antique chairs that she has up in the attic. I said, it's perfectly fine. He comes back, he says, I have the measurements. He said, my wife measured, she said, it's a 140-year-old chair, she thinks. 
I said, what was the measurement? He said, 29 inches. And I thought, oh, no. Don't ever do these kind of things unless you know what they're going to say because he's undermining my very point. <laughs> 29 inches. And then he said, no, 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 no. It's a love seed. It's a seed for two. <laughs> we have changed, haven't we? We have changed big time. Just to give you some idea, some of you may have seen this, obviously, how obesity has crept up in our society. This is now data from 1985, and I could give you the data for every year since then. I'll just focus on every five years. And here's what I want you to really take a look at. Look at the change in color of the various states of the United States there. And I give you the results of the percentage of adult people that are obese in our society. 1985, less than 10%. Five years later, 5% more. Five years later, 5% more yet. Five years later, 5% more yet. See, now it's already over 20% of the population. Before we started, 1985 was less than 10% of all the adults being obese. Now it's 2000, 2005, we're now looking at um, uh, more than 25 to 29% of them are obese. And 2010, the latest data that we have, more than 30% of the adults in America are suffering from obesity. 35% of them are now obese, and 35% of them are overweight, 70%. There's only one normal person out of three American adults in terms of weight. I showed these, uh, these uh, pictures, and a lady spoke up, and she said, Sir, can I say something? I said, of course. And then she said to me, my grandmother was obese, my grandfather was obese, my father was obese, my mother was obese, I'm obese, we're all obese, it's a genetic problem, you cannot blame it on us. And I didn't want to embarrass her and get into an argument. I just don't dislike these kind of controversial things. I talked that over later on, but I thought to myself, many people have this idea, maybe I should respond to that. And so I said to her very gently, would you mind if I ask you a personal question? And I said, now, your grandmother was obese, your grandfather was obese, your father was obese, your mother, yes, genetics. And then I said, do you happen to have a dog? And she said, yes. Is the dog overweight? Yes. Is it genetics? <laughs> now, you see, we have to remember that when it comes to genetic aspects, yes, genetics can play a role, but you can override the genetic predisposition through an epigenetic system that suppresses the expression of the genetic code that is there. As a matter of fact, it, it's very fascinating. When it comes to epigenetics, epigenetics is something like you have a jockey that rides a horse, the horse being the genetic code, the genetics, the inherent uh, tendencies that you have. But it's the, 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 the jockey that guides the horse where it's going to go. Genetics is like the loaded gun for disease. The lifestyle is the trigger. So if you have a good lifestyle, you can actually suppress the expression of the genetic makeup. We are not destined. Our DNA doesn't have to be our destiny. <laughs> but we are concerned about obesity. When I went to school some years back, we didn't talk about it. Some people are large, some people are small. It's just a difference. Uh, it's individuality, just like we sometimes glibly say, well, there is no real optimal diet. Uh, everybody has to find their own way. Uh, we have to check uh, chromosome number 19. Folks, the Chinese have been around for 4,000 years. They never had any chance to check chromosome 19 to know what they were supposed to eat. Are you with me there? 
What happened to common sense? We now understand that the larger the girth line, the shorter the lifeline. We know that every pound above the ideal weight will take one month of your life. So if you're 60 pounds overweight, you basically pay for it with five years of shorter lifespan. So obesity has some significant consequences in terms of life expectancy. And then you ask the question, well, what is an ideal weight? We know that if you are looking at some of the actuarial data that comes from life insurance companies, they can tell you exactly what the ideal customer is that will live the longest or the shortest so that they can adjust their premiums. And they found out in these actuarial data studies that go back all the way to 1959, the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company, they noticed that there was a height and weight relationship. The taller you are, the more weight is allowed. They also noticed that sometimes there is a relationship to bone size. And so when they began to look at this, um, they, they, they came up with some uh, basic um, underlying uh, understanding, and they said, for every five feet of height for a man, we'll give you 100 pounds. And for every inch above five feet, we'll allow you six, po six pounds per inch. So if you're 5'10", what would that be? 5'10"? Five, five feet is 100 pounds. 10 inches is another 10 times 6, 160 pounds. Ideal weight in terms of longevity, ideal number four, morbidity for health and disease. Now, they also looked at women. Uh, would you like to know or you rather not? <laughs> so again, yeah, they had five feet, 100 pounds, and then ladies are, were given an extra inch in height for that high heel, and so if you're 5'2", they would actually look at 5'3". The first 5 feet, 100 pounds. The next 3 inches, 5 pounds each. So if you're 5'2", you would actually look at 5'3", that would give you 115 pounds. So you have, you have large bones, will add another 8, 9, 10%. And you say, that's impossible. I mean, I would look like a scarecrow. Hey, folks, we have become so large in this country that we have found new reference points. <laughs> we are overweight and we think we're normal because the society looks that way. And you know, when you relate to people that are overweight, you are in danger of becoming overweight too because you are sharing the habits of your friends that may be overweight. So be careful how you pick your friends. <laughs> That's right. You see, when it comes to um, the morbidity aspect, uh, we know that a very heavy person, but let me maybe help you to understand something else, and that is that how do you really determine whether you're overweight or obese? We already talked about the idea that you can look at light, height and weight charts, right? And that's what people do. They find their weight, and they say, oh my goodness, I'm too short. <laughs> and since we cannot do any stretching, you're stuck. Now, you can do something else. You can go to your uh, left side of the rib cage, the, the lowest rib, and you can do a pinch test. Mm -hmm. Now, you see, if this is more than one inch, you just have to pinch harder. And then we have the uh, body mass index, BMI. And that's sort of a new concept now where we have certain relationships there again between height and weight, the BMI. And when you have a BMI over 40, which classifies you as being very, very obese, here are some of the risks. When you're very obese with a BMI over 40, the risk for diabetes increases by seven times. Diabetes and obesity are cousins. 
the hooked up at the hip. Be careful, especially if it's visceral. This kind of a diabetes right here. This kind of a fat right here. High blood pressure increases six times. You can see the data right there. Heart disease increases, arthritis, asthma, sleep apnea, and it promotes uh, the risk of breast, prostate, and colon, and, and cervical cancer. And of course, people that are carrying that much weight, they're also under the scrutiny of a society which rather looks askance at them sometimes, and they, feel, they internalize this. Um, there's depression that often comes. Uh, uh, we can also talk about uh, ACE, uh, uh, scores, these are refer this is referred to um, adversive childhood experiences. The person now an adult is an adult, and yet the upbringing is still playing itself out into depression, as we heard the other day here in the conference. So, who's responsible for this emerging crisis? By the way, I should also mention to you that we now understand that if you wanted to change the genetics of a society, it would take about 300 to 400 years. This epidemic here has happened in the last 40, 50 years. This is not a genetics. Whatever genetics are there, it's a minor part. So then who is responsible? It's not the DNA. Who is responsible for the obesity in our society? Help me with that. Please. Give me some, give me some ideas. You are not responsible for your obesity. Media. Do you believe this? Am I setting a trap? Yes. <laughs> okay, you are not exclusively responsible for your overweight. Are you agreeing with that? Yes. Who are the players that are contributing to obesity? Help me. Yes. You have advertising. Raise your hand. Advertising. Media. Media marketing. Twiggy, yeah, oh. We are in the same age bracket, aren't we? Yeah, I, I remember Twiggy. I mean, Twiggy was totally shapeless. Pencil. Olive oil. I'm still talking about Twiggy right now. Twiggy is like this. At Twiggy, these models on these beautiful magazines where the beautiful people are being displayed, they all look like this. And especially our ladies in our society are internalizing these kind of images. And men, too, they begin to think, and this should be really the model that I married. Hmm. And you see the pressures? And then you open up the magazine, and you see more beautiful women. And then you see restaurants. And then you see recipes. And the recipes are for a romantic evening and for coronary heart attack. <laughs> and you begin to see the inconsistency. We become schizoid. We become schizophrenic. On one hand, people say, you ought to look like this. On the other hand, we're seducing everybody on every area. The television. I mean, just think about this. All the ads that you see on television, many of them are for, for first, they're for food, and then for drugs. Yes. And they're connected. Yes. One causes the other. Yeah, you see, and nobody can live up to these kind of artificial things. And so you feel the pressure. And so that's why it's so important that you know who you are and you accept yourself the way you are because you're part of a universe that is not just a random speck out there, but there's a higher purpose involved. Are you with me? And so it's very difficult so the magazines, they project these slim-figured, well-busted women, as you pointed out. And yet, on the other hand, nobody can live this way. Nobody can accomplish this unless you have some special interventions. <laughs> and so you begin to, to feel the pressure, and you begin to realize Nobody loves me because I'm just not the right shape. I mean, I don't, you don't even love yourself anymore because I cannot live up to what I've internalized. And we need to become aware that we are in charge. You need to find your own self. You are just as valuable if you have 20 inches between you and me when we meet. 
or whether you are coming very close to me. It doesn't matter. You're just having the same value and worth. So don't let anybody internally begin to put yourself down. But begin to do something about your health and about your weight. Do something about for the sake of health. And when you begin to eat and live where health is a priority, the scale will take care of itself. Let all diets die. Diets have no place in a rational weight control program. If you want to be healthy, you become lean automatically because you begin to eat the right foods, you get into the exercise program, you get your six, seven, eight hours of sleep, and things begin to happen. Are you with me? Yeah. Yes. Don't become tyrannized by the scale. Of course, there are many, many aspects of uh, why we are what we are. <clears throat> Some of it can relate to your upbringing. If you were breastfed, chances are that you have less obesity to worry about than if you had the bottle, because you probably have excessive fat cells that have accumulated because you were not breastfed, because somehow, when it comes to breastfeeding, there's always the right amount there, always the right temperature, the packaging is great. <laughs> but when it comes to the formula, you never quite know what happens. So you can lay the foundation right there. Then, upbringing. When I grew up um, and I didn't want to finish my plate, my mother had this idea. She always said, if you don't eat your food, if you don't finish the plate, all the children in Ethiopia will be dying. And I didn't want this to happen, so I began to clean my plate. Now I'm 30, 40 years of age, right? I mean, I should have learned a few things, right? But I'm sitting there, I'm struggling with a little bit of extra weight, and the, the food is there, I'm just about finished, uh, but there's some leftovers, and all of a sudden, somebody pushes the button. All oh, the children in Ethiopia are going to be dying. And so you finish it, conditioning, right? So you begin to realize that it's a very complex issue. Overweight is not an easy issue. It's a very complex issue, but there are some answers that I can give you today that if you follow them, you have an 80% chance that you're going to be what you want to be. Where you begin to lose one and a half to two pounds a week, and you do it for life. Just the opposite of what we do today. You know you have a family union coming up. You know you have to go to a wedding. You know you have a, a high school reunion coming up. 50 years, 40 years, 30 years. <gasps> And you look for the quick answer, and it betrays you every time. Let all diets die. If you want to be a winner in the losing game, you have to go for the long haul, one and a half to two weeks, two and a half to two pounds a week. I mean, obviously, food has something to do with extra calories, right? Because when you have... Um, when you develop uh, overweight, obviously it has something to do with the calories that you take in, right? It also has something to do with the calories that you burn. But you see, the society is really conspiring against us. You see, we used to have a natural way of exerting ourselves and burning calories. That is no longer the case. I mean, we now say that if you're six, seven, eight hours sitting down at the computer, you have the same risk for certain disease as if you were a full-time smoker. As a matter of fact, I don't mind if you folks all stand up and listen to me because I'm helping you to improve your health right now. Yes. In our office, we have these special little... They go up and down, and everybody stands up, work on the computer, standing. It's a new age. We're beginning to understand more and more about this. But we also recognize that it's not just the calories that we don't expend anymore, but it's also the calories that we take in. And somebody mentioned marketing, advertising. Take a look. This is what you see. A Kellogg company, for instance, for just one brand, Frosted Flakes in this case, spends $40 million in advertising. Dairy industry spends almost $200 million in advertising that if you don't have your three glasses of milk, you're going to fall apart. And then you have McDonald's, $800 million. And then you have the national effort. Here's the National Cancer Institute telling you you should eat more fruits and vegetables, and you can hardly see how much money they spend. It's less than $1 million. 
Do you see who drives the habits? Do you see who's responsible for the obesity? It has to do not just with ourselves, but it has to do with the obesogenic environment in which we live in. It's about 40, 50 years ago when it all started. It started with the emergence of the fast food products that were sold to us as a convenience foods. Women would join the workforce and they have no more time and they need to have convenience foods. That was the mantra. Folks, it's easy to cook foods from scratch in no time because there's something called a slow cooker. It's called a crock pot. I mean, I prepare the breakfast in my family when I'm at home and my wife is so generous, she always says to me, my husband is also cooking. Well, I mean, I take about five minutes, I have a crock pot, I throw some seven grain cereal into it from Bob's Red Mill, and uh, the next morning I wake up, it's done. I mean, folks, you don't have to rush to McDonald's and get your bacon, eggs, and ham there. It's easy once you understand that you see the dramatic change that has happened. This is the most important uh, slide this morning for your consideration. And it has to do with the macronutrient distribution that the former speaker talked about. This is the key issue, macronutrient distribution. And macronutrients means the distribution of fat, of protein, of sugar, and starch, the, the, the distribution. And here you see, uh, on the left-hand side, this is now a country where you cannot find heart disease, you cannot find obesity, you cannot find arthritis, you cannot find diabetes. These are countries where 70 to 80% of the calories will come from carbohydrates. Are you listening? They don't come from carbohydrates as such. They come from complex carbohydrates. Not as such. They come from unrefined complex carbohydrates. Are you with me there? These people eat whole foods. These people don't eat white flour products as much as they eat whole grains. They eat corn, they eat beans, they eat potatoes, they eat these kind of foods. And these societies always have had slim people. They're starch eaters, but the right starch. They're blessed with fiber, with roughage, and nutritional value. But as a society begins to change, as a society goes from slow food to fast food, something happens. When a society goes from eating at home to eating out, when a society goes from whole food to processed foods, when a society goes from potatoes to Pringles, when a society goes from corn to corn chips, when a society goes from oats to Oreos, when a society goes from beans to burgers, when a society goes from water to soft drinks, when a society does that, it goes from lean to large. And when you look at the chart, you see this is the American diet, the Western diet, that is now going viral globally. On the right-hand side, you see this diet is such that about 40%, 35 to 40% of the calories will now come from oils, grease, and fat. Another 20-some percent will come from sugar, again, a refined food. Then you have some starch, and the starch no longer carries 70% of the total volume, but maybe just about 10, 15 at the very most. But the starch that you eat now is totally refined white flour product. This is what you eat now as coming to you as Krispy Kreme, as donuts, as cakes as pies. It's a totally different starch. It's refined, it's devoid of nutritional value and devoid of fiber. It gives you volume. And then you look at the amount of protein. We have seen an incredible increase in the amount of protein. People used to get their protein from foods as grown, plant foods. Today, 70% of the protein in our society comes from animal sources. Whenever you have this kind of a diet on the right-hand side, you will always find within 10 years, in a society that didn't have these chronic diseases, within 10 years, you find the emergence of these, what we used to call Western diseases that are now global diseases. 
10 years. Japan, it was difficult to find heart disease there. But America did not only bring MacArthur to Japan, but also McDonald's. And within 20 years, Japan was showing the signs of diabetes, of heart disease, and some of these Western killer diseases. This is what we eat in our society. About 50% of our calories come from processed foods. I know that you're concerned about moving towards a plant-based diet. I'm all in favor of that. But let us not forget, the next issue is processed foods. You can be a vegan and be a junkie. And so we need to have the idea that a plane has two wings, and to be healthy, you have to have at least two wings when it comes to the dietary issues. You have to have more planned foods, high nutritional value, low in calories, and on the other hand, you have to also have unprocessed foods, whole foods, rather than processed foods. Please note that about 35% of the calories that we eat comes from animal products, and the shocking experience to me was to find out that only 14% of the calories that we eat come from unprocessed foods. I recommend to people all over the world, I said, I want you to zero in on eating more foods that don't carry nutrition labels. Ever thought about that? You have no nutrition labels on mangoes, on tomatoes, on tomatoes. You don't. And you say, well, there are no nutrition labels on meat either. True. Because the industry has resisted that. They didn't want you to know that when you have a sirloin steak, that's 75% fat. When you have that pork chop, that 80% of the calories is fat. But you will find a warning label on meats, on chicken, how to prepare it because of bacterial contamination. So I have enlarged my definition of what I recommend people to eat. Eat more food that don't have nutrition labels or warning labels. <laughs> we need to increase that minority role of fruits, vegetables, whole grains and legumes, and perhaps a few nuts and seeds. We need to increase this to more like 60, 70 percent. Now, as you all know, if you have more calories coming into the system and going out, they're being deposited in, in, in a bank. I mean, you put more money into the bank than you withdraw, there's going to be a surplus developing, right? And that's exactly what happens in American bodies, because they're putting more and more food in, but less goes out in terms of exercise. And what happens next, there are deposits in the central bank right here. And after a while, the central bank is no longer sufficient, and it has to set up branch offices in different parts of the body. <laughs> and now you become really, really uh, uh, concerned about this. I mean, think about all the things, how we're being seduced, how easy it is. You have the television on. The television, the brakes are always there, and we talked about that already. There's always food being advertised much of the time, and then some medications. And you know, when these advertisements, the ads come on, you see millions of feet shuffling in the direction of the kitchen. Did you know that the ads are always loud in volume because I think they all know that you are leaving. And what do you do? You look for your carrot sticks and for your celery sticks. <laughs> you better come in crinkly bags, right? And today we begin to realize that there is a lot of snacking taking place. I think. Somebody said to me, I just eat one meal a day. I said, really? Yeah, I eat all day long. <laughs> I'm a grazer. I go from patch to patch all day long, and it became very obvious what had happened. So we need to begin to understand that once you have accumulated 3,500 calories, on the average, you probably have put on one extra pound of fat. And so when we become aware, you know... <laughs> You lose some of your agility. You know, you begin to realize after all, you can't see your toes anymore. You can't bend down anymore. And you begin to realize, I need to do something about this. And then you check out the power lane as you go through the chopping place, the, the food market. And they're all there. 
Seven pounds in seven days, 14 pounds in two weeks. They're all there. The latest diet is, is advertised there. First it was the grape nut diet, and then they began to realize maybe you should give it a more credible name. We call it the mayo grape nut diet. And so people eat grape nuts and grape nuts and grape nuts, and guess what? They lose the weight. And after two, three, four weeks, you know, they have put all their large clothes on one side of the closet already because I'm going to be swelty. And then after four, five, six weeks, it's all back up again. And so they said, this really didn't work too well. And so now they see the new advertisement there as you pass the, the, the shelves there. And now they're advertising the, the grapefruit diet. Now this is the UCLA grapefruit diet. And what you do, you eat grapefruits and grapefruits and grapefruits and grapefruits that are coming out of your ears. And guess what? After four weeks, you have lost 30 pounds. Wow, it really works. And again, I'm going to be lean. I found the answer. But these are, these are diets that are based on monotony. You cannot live on these diets. This is a temporary thing. And so the diet will fall by the wayside, and a new diet comes in, right? And this time it's the grape diet, this, the, the green grape diet. And it has all kinds of, Dr. Oz is recommending it, let's just say. You know, and you say, no, that must be right. And then it's on, 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 on Oprah, or oh, that must be right. The green, green grape diet. And you eat grapes and grapes and grapes and grapes, and you're losing the weight. And all you get out of it, when you look back, you get sour grapes. And you say, there's something wrong with me. I mean, how come? Uh, I, I don't seem to be able to do it. It must be my gland. Well, it can be the gland sometimes, you know. In 2% of people that have thyroid function problems, you better get that squared away first before you try to lose weight because otherwise your efforts will not materialize at all. So thyroid problems sometimes can be a case, but it's only 2% of the people that are struggling with overweight. But then you say, well, maybe it's not the thyroid gland. Maybe it's the salivary gland. Do you love to eat? And so I talked to you about it. Do you love to eat? Oh, I don't, I don't eat very much. I mean, I don't know how I gain this weight. It must be in the air somehow. It, it doesn't work for me. I mean, I eat like a bird, and I... What kind of a bird are you? A vulture? I do all this exercise, and nothing's working for me. Yeah, let's take a look at this. So you now decide, I need to eat less. And what you do, you watch your serving size. You go on same as starvation diets. You have hunger pangs. And after that, three months, you say, it's not worth it. I rather, I don't care anymore. It's not worth it. I don't want to live this way any longer. And then somebody says, oh, you need to exercise. So what do you think you do? You get into, yeah, that's right. You go on some of the television uh, programs there, exercise. And you say, exercise is the answer. I mean, you see it, the big losers, right? But you don't realize that they're exercising 10 hours a day because they want to be the biggest loser. So, so here, I have these two ladies coming to me. Uh, they're in my age, 70 years of age. So they come to me and said, Doctor, I'd like to lose some weight, but I don't want to change my diet. I said, that's fine. You want to exercise? Yes. Can you give me a prescription? So I give them a prescription for the next five months. I said, I want you to walk every day, six times a week, from, from the medical center all the way to Stater Brothers, the store where you buy food. Okay, now I want you to go back and forth and do it six times a week. After four months, they come back to me and they said, Doctor, your program doesn't work. We have gained weight. I mean, there's some mathematics involved here, right? I go through the mathematics. I go through the adherence program. Have you really done this every day? No. We have done it six times a week. We took one day off. I said, that's perfect. Six times a week, that's, that's great. And you walk every day from the medical center to Stater Brothers? Yes, sir. And so I look at the other lady for validation check. I said, oh, yes, we're doing this together. We've done this all these weeks, and it doesn't work. I mean, you've gone from the medical center, that's 1.1 mile, to Stater Brothers. Now, when you go to Stater Brothers, then you turn around. Um, well, we go inside. <laughs> and what do you do there? Oh, we have a Krispy Kreme. <laughs> I 
And I say, do you realize then when you, when you walk 1.1 mile, you're burning about 110 calories, and you walk back, it's another 110 calories. You've burned 220 calories. When you have that Krispy Kreme, it's 420 calories. Of course, you're gaining 200 calories every time you make that walk and stop there and eat. I said, it gives you much pleasure, doesn't it? Oh, yes. But you're gaining weight. Is it really worth it? Maybe it's easier just to let go of the donut. I said, is it really worth it? And Reddy says, oh yes, doctor, it's worth it. <laughs> Do you see the allurement, the habituation? I'm working for, for Chrysler the auto manufacturing company, we do a chip program there for the employees to lower their medical costs. It's going very, very well. I spent several months there. It's uh, a great joy to me to empower these people to begin to shift towards a dietary program that doesn't have nutrition labels or warning labels and get into a daily walking program and just to learn how to handle stress, stop smoking, and just be a nicer person. But I made a mistake. I cannot mention to them that I love M&Ms. And so I get a package at the hotel. And it's wrapped in this uh, duct tape. So I know it's an engineer that is sending this. Only engineers do these kind of things. So I have to first work hard to get to this little package. And inside, a packet of M&M and a note. We challenge you. One M&M a day. I love M&M's, so I take my first pill. I'm fine. The next morning I wake up and uh, I see the M&M's, I've poured them all out on the night table and there were 96 initially, now it's only 95, right? So I have another 95 days to do this. So it's 95 M&M's there on the night table, I have another one, one a day, right? And I feel so good I can go to work now. I'm doing fine, because I had my little fix. I come home at night at 10 o'clock, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I in, in, in invest myself in the mental uh, struggle of helping people to make some good choices, and then I begin to feel sorry for myself. Why am I doing this? I mean, I have a beautiful wife back in Loma Linda in Southern California, I have two children, why am I doing this kind of thing? And I feel sorry for myself, I feel really sorry for myself. I said, I should stop this, this is nonsense. And, but, ah. Uh, there's my M&M. I'll be okay now, okay? And I'm reaching out for my M&M because I'm okay now. It's... And some little voice says to me, didn't you have one this morning? I said, no, 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 I didn't. Yes, you did. No, 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 you did. And I begin to become very confused. And then I said, well, I can figure that out. I just count the M&Ms. So I count all the M&Ms, right? There were 96 before, I'd taken two already, right? So it's 90, 94 now, right? 96, 94. So I count all the M&Ms, but my mind tells me I didn't have one in the morning, so there should be 95. I count all the M&Ms, and then 94, I said, I counted it wrong. So I begin to take them two halves, and I count 47, and 47, it is still 94. I must have had, no, 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 you count it wrong again. So I divide them one more time, a quarter, a quarter, a quarter, a quarter, and I add them all up, it's still 94. Do you see, that's the addiction that we have, and it has to do with our feelings. Why do we eat? Feelings, big time. We celebrate with food. We take care of our disappointments with food. We overdose on food. We celebrate the most important high days of our lives from the baptism of a child all the way to the funeral with the worst foods that we probably could choose. The wedding cake. It's not an easy way. And something else, when you go shopping, whatever you put into that cart and you bring home, you're going to eat. Be careful what you put to this shopping cart be in full possession of your emotions and your mental well-being when you go shopping. Best thing is you know what you want to get. As a matter of fact, when I go shopping, 
I'll do it sometimes by myself or with my wife. We shop for a whole week in 15 minutes because I know exactly where to go. I go to the fresh produce, right? I know where the grains are, the whole grains. I know where the, um, the, the legumes are, my beans and, and lentils. I maybe pick up a few nuts and maybe some avocados and I'm fine. Do you know that there are some 50 to 60,000 food items in a large supermarket that is handling food for you? And out of these 50,000, you probably only need 100. Seduction. So do you realize that um, if you really want to walk off that Krispy Kreme, you have to walk four miles? If you want to have a Big Mac and fries and a Super Coke, you have to walk for seven hours. I mean, you have to be unemployed. You have to go on vacation. You have to take days off. Walking is not the way to lose weight. Walking is something that you do because it empowers you. It gives you vitality. It's the right thing to do. But don't do it for losing weight. That's a side effect. So I want to give you the new paradigm. And that if you want to lose weight, eat more. Not less. And exercise more for good health. Are you with me? Are you open to considering that? Let me give you five suggestions here. Number one is <clears throat> reduce empty calories. Now, you know what that is. These are foods that have no uh, nutrition value. They're basically empty calories, emptied of nutrition. And one of the big factors here is uh, sugar, refined sugar. Most people consume about 30 teaspoons of sugar a day. College students, more like 40 to 45 teaspoons a day, and it mostly comes, one third of this comes from soda pop. This is what an average family consumes here in America. Uh, husband and wife and two children in elementary school, 32 cans, and every can has 10 to 12 teaspoons of sugar. But there's some other things too. I mean, look at this. Uh, that's what I always tell my patients. I said, uh, what I want you to do is I want you to look at this donut anatomically. Examine it very closely. And then always opt for the whole, and then you'll be safe. <laughs> Just one piece of German chocolate cake, 15 teaspoons, banana split, 25 teaspoons, and this is what we give to our children. We think this is cereal. This is not cereal. This is a candy. I was uh, at uh, Battle Creek one time to give a lecture there, and I should have known better. <laughs> and I told the people that Fruit Loops is 52% sugar, and a man raised his hand, a dignified man. I knew I was in trouble. And he said, sir, I'm the vice president of marketing for the Kellogg Corporation. This is not true what you're saying. It is not 52%. We have just lowered it to 48%. Yeah. <laughs> and this is what we do. The people that can least afford these foods are the ones that buy them because it's all a matter of education. You see, you can have a pound of oats for less than $2, but people buy them in terms of fruit loops, and all of a sudden, the amount of one pound of grain equivalent would cost you now $12. So you have to just spend six times more dollars. I just came back from Haiti, and the difference there was, the difference was 10 times. And there are all these American foods, and they buy these kind of foods because it's a matter of educational understanding. What we need is education, motivation, inspiration, and do it in a caring, loving environment. So, sugar, 16%, fats, oil, and grease. These are refined fats and oils. These are not the fat that you have in meat, because at least you have some nutritional value there. But these are refined uh, oils and fats, okay? Just think about this. You have, it takes 14 ears of corn to produce one tablespoon of corn oil. If you wouldn't have the industrial processes that can extract the oil from the ears of corn, could you eat one tablespoon of corn oil equivalent by eating the ears of corn? How many of you could eat 14 ears of corn? Nature somehow is, is a master marketer in packaging. But then we come along, we take the ears of corn, we throw all the good stuff away, all the nutritional value, all the fiber, everything goes. We give this to our pigs and we give this to our animals, you know, and, and we eat the oil. Very bright. And look what happens. With all that oil available, you take corn chips, just one little bag of corn chips, nine ounces, has 1,440 calories. That's what an average woman should be eating that has a five-foot height frame. That's for the whole day. People don't do that. 
That's just, they don't even remember when they had it. And look at these kind of foods. You know what they are. And actually, they will tell you, once you pop it, you cannot. How do you know this? Oh, you did some research on it, I see. Okay. Yeah. See, this is just one little bag of potato chips, 1,100 calories. You would have to eat 11 uh, uh, potatoes to get the same number of calories. Nature is a master in packaging. We are not. We are condensing the calories. And the process, we're in trouble. Look at this. I mean, this looks good, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Especially before dinner, right? Yeah. It goes in very easily. I mean, I was shocked to look at This is a large milkshake, but nevertheless, it's 2,000 calories. My wife is an exerciser. She's 5'2". She needs about 1,600 calories. Just one milkshake would exceed the allowance for the day. Because you see there, you have 153 grams of sugar. That's about 40 teaspoons of sugar in one milkshake. And then you have about 113 grams of fat. And look at the number of calories in fat. Now, I should tell you one more thing before I go into lesson number two. We talked about this book here. This is a fascinating story where this man becomes like a literary detective. He interviews the retired CEOs of some of these large companies that are producing processed foods. Now, people, when they're working for these companies, they don't talk. But they will talk when they retire. They will talk on their deathbeds. And then you learn that these companies, especially those that have been purchased by Philip Morris, they know exactly how to hijack your brain chemistry because they have done through brain research, they have done their work and they know that you have to have a certain amount of salt to get this bliss point experience. You need to have just the right amount of sugar. If it's high enough, you taste it on your tongue, You've got 10,000 receptor cells there. And within nanoseconds, the message is traveling to the pleasure center of your brain where the opiate receptors. And it says, yes, take more. Bliss point, nirvana. <laughs> yes. Oh, and you cannot resist. That's why you need to have that second M&M. That's why you have to have that second Oreo. That's why you have to have that second Pringle. Are you with me there? And then the same thing is true for fat. And that's why some thoughtful people have said that this book that really um, highlights what is happening behind the scenes, um, it, it, it suggests that, that fat and salt and sugar in excess may be purposefully used by the processed food manufacturers to create brain activation of the pleasure centers, and with that, the allure and the habituation, if not the addiction to these products. Overweight, it's a very complex issue. We're living in an obesogenic environment where obesity surrounds us. It's difficult. You have to become really reinforced in your own mindset, who you are and what your long-term goals are, otherwise you are sitting duck. So we talked about Principle number one, reduce empty calories. That means reduce sugar products. Number two, reduce refined fats and oils because when you add the alcohol to it as well, then you begin to realize that almost 50% of the calories we eat in America that is now going viral around the world, 50%, almost half the calories, have no nutritional value. They are just taste sensations. They're chemical concoctions made to seduce you. And so we are a society that is malnourished because we're overfed. Overfed and undernourished. Now you all know that for every gram of fat, there are nine calories. For every gram of alcohol, there are seven calories. For every gram of protein and sugar and starch, there are four calories. Of course, water doesn't have any calories. So if you really want to lose weight, be careful with, with the concept of taking in too many fatty calories. Are you with me? 
because every gram has nine calories. And you say, well, does it include olive oil too? I mean, do you have olive gardens here in yeah. where, you, where you live? Yeah. But, you know, olive garden, you go there, and they bring you a nice little bowl with double virgin cold-pressed olive oil. <sighs> and then they give you two slices of fluffy white bread, and you use it like a sponge. <laughs> and you say, oh, I have the Mediterranean diet. And all of a sudden... Because every gram has nine calories. It doesn't matter whether it is olive oil or sunflower oil or whatever oil. Every gram of oil has nine calories. There is no good oil if you are concerned about overweight. The only safe oil to buy is WD-40. <laughs> but don't eat it. Don't drink it. We have to cut back on these oils. Because these are empty calories. There's very little nutrition value there. And you get your omega 3 very easily from some of the nuts and from the grains and from, of course, some of the, the avocados. There's no need for worrying about omega 3. Nature seemingly knew how to package itself for our benefit almost anywhere in the world. It's an amazing concept. But now comes principle number two. We need to do something about fat in general. Where does most of the fat come from? Most of the fat that we eat in America comes from meat, poultry, and fish, number one, and number two, salad oils and shortening and dairy products. That accounts for 85% of all the fat that we eat. So we need to think about cutting back on those sources. For instance, when you talk to someone about meat, they always say, well, meat, I need to have my meat because I need to have my protein. We are going to have uh, uh, more protein uh, uh, to, to be grown because we're going from 7 billion to 10 billion. Wait a minute. Protein is everywhere. You take a glass of orange juice, you take an, an orange by itself, you have one gram of protein in an orange. People don't understand this. Protein is everywhere unless you eat junk food. So there's always enough protein there. The concern is that we have too much protein. We're probably taking two times the amount that we need or should have. So there's not an issue. So when you think of, when somebody tells you about meat, always help them to understand. You mean protein? Hmm. Protein is only 25%. Do you know what the other 75% comes from? Fat? Oh, no, no, no. I trim my fat off. So you go from 75% to 63% fat. This is a high-fat food. You cannot get at it. It's between these muscle layers there. You look at these hamburgers. You look at the sausages, the wiener at the very bottom there. You know, you have that um, hot dog, that American hot dog. I mean, think what happens at these ball games. Hot dog, it's 85% fat, and you wouldn't dare want to know what the other 15% is made from. You will never eat another hot dog. This is what happened to the American uh, diet. You see a dramatic increase in meat consumption, particularly with the um, chickens, fowl. You know, uh, I think I showed this uh, slide uh, last year when I spoke here, and I talked about the idea that the average meat eater consumes 12 cows in a lifetime. I mean, from the lips all the way to the tail. And if we cannot eat it, we grind it down and we put it into pink slime, as we call this. Plus 25 hogs and 2,000 some chickens. Chickens that have never seen the sun most of the time. And then you have cheese. You know, again, it's, it's really too bad because I was born close to the Dutch border on the German side and cheese was something very special. But once I understood that cheese is about 65 to 75 percent fat, and it's the number, listen to this, listen very carefully, this is the number one source of saturated fat in the American diet today. Cheese is the number one source of saturated fat in the American diet, and saturated fat drives the liver to go into overdrive in producing cholesterol. When I was in China, 30 years ago, it was difficult to find heart disease there. We checked the cholesterol levels of these farmers. They had cholesterol levels of 80 and 90 and 100. When they were up to 120, they start worrying. We were going to have a heart attack like the Americans. They said, no, 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 don't worry. They have, to, they have 200 out there. 
No suicides. No violence. These were basically plant-based, whole food eating people. When we reverse heart disease, we always want to get the cholesterol down to at least 150, 140. When we do this, the arteries begin to open up and they melt down the plaques on the inside. Dr. Ornish, Dr. Esselstein, other researchers. Cheese consumption, you see the dramatic increase there? <clears throat> All starting in about 1970. What happened in 1970? Do you remember? 1975? Fast foods, right? Cheese. I mean, you need the cheese as a glue to hold all these things together. <laughs> you know, 1975, the dairy industry began to change because they found out that the population began to understand that, that a glass of whole milk had the equivalent of three strips of bacon, which is high in saturated fat and not associated usually with giving you healthy hearts, right? He said, you mean in one glass of milk, saturated fat is that high? We don't want any more of the saturated fat in, the, in, our, in our milk. We want 2%, 1%, skim milk, blue water. And the industry said, yeah, we're happy to do this. We respond to the customer's wishes. Guess what they did with all the cream that they took out of the milk? They shipped it to China? To Africa? No, they made it into cheese. I mean, can't you see that executive there? He's really upset. He told his wife, I want to have skim milk. He, she has been very, very good about it, but now she forgot. And there's that whole glass of milk, and he is upset. He's an executive. He said, look, what are you trying to do to me? You want to be a rich widow? No, pass the cheeseburger. You didn't get it, did you? On one hand, he's very worried about saturated fat. He wants to have skim milk. On the other hand, he demands a cheeseburger. That's why in our CHIP program, we need 40 hours of instruction to give people a complete holistic concept of health. Because half-truths just mislead us. So here's some very powerful um, material that is just coming out of the famous Adventist health study, headquartered in Loma Linda. The government has spent over $35 million dollars over the years on the study of Adventist people. These are people that are living a very similar lifestyle. They don't smoke usually, they don't have any alcohol usually, they go to church once a week, uh, they're nice people. I've lived there for 40 years, coming from Germany, I can attest to that. And, but there is something that's different among these Adventists because about 10% of these people are vegans, about 30% of them are lacto-over-vegetarians. And the rest, oh, 10% are fish eaters, vegetarian plus fish. And the rest, 50%, they're meat eaters. So the question was asked, they looked at 100,000 Adventist people in North America. Seven-year study, just is coming out now. I'll give you some of the latest information. They found that among women, the meat-eating Adventist women weighed about 180 pounds. Those that have the green color, the vegans, only had 141 pounds. Difference is about 40 pounds. But you also notice you can go to the fish-eating vegetarians, they're in blue, and you then don't have quite as much a weight problem. You may be 10 pounds less. But the best results always come when you go and check out the green color. Now for men, the meat-eating Adventist men, on the average, weigh about 193 pounds. Those that are, you know, whole plant-based food people, the green color there, they're about 30 pounds less. So what's the lesson to be taken home? If you wanted to have a handle on obesity, if you want to manage your overweight more effectively, what's the answer? Move towards what color? Yeah. Now, if you also then begin to cut back on processed foods, you have a winning combination. It shouldn't be too difficult, especially if there are no medical conditions like thyroid and so on that could play a role sometimes. What about nuts? Nuts are very high in fat. Just to give you some idea, you have one small can of mixed nuts that is 1,700 calories. That is a half a pound of fat. When you finish that, you have put on your hips a half a pound of fat. So we recommend that you use some nuts because they're very nutritious, but you use them in small amounts. 
Now, I don't know what a small amount is because everybody tries to interpret that as they like it. So, but let us say a half a handful, maybe eight, nine, ten walnut halves, maybe some six, seven, eight almonds. They're excellent foods nutritionally. They're clearly preventing heart disease. They're helping in the process. You actually can demonstrate that those people that eat nuts every day usually live two years longer, among some other things, that add more uh, life to these people's lifespan. So when it comes to avocados, it's almost pure butter. Use it, small slices. Enjoy it. Don't feel guilty. Just be careful, especially if you're concerned about overweight. If you're underweight, have a little bit more, and you're fine. Okay? If you're underweight, cut back on raw salads. They're very nutritious, but there's not enough calories there unless you put a lot of avocado in there. In general, you want to eat the food the way it comes in nature. Because you see, you can eat three apples, or you can have half a glass of apple juice, and the calories are the same. Which would fill you up more? So, principles number one and two had to do with reducing empty calories. Principle number two then had to do with reducing animal products, because they're usually high in fat, they're also high in cholesterol, there are many, many other issues too, and they're usually, they have no fiber in their food. There's no fiber content in meat and cheese. Okay, now comes number three. Is there anything left to eat? You know better than that, right? Of course, you have whole fruits, you have vegetables, you have whole grains, you have legumes, you have some nuts and seeds, and you know, you really want to, I want to spell this out, and that is that these foods are all very low in calories, except maybe the nuts and seeds, and we restrict them a little bit. What does 100,000 mean? I'm glad you set me up for that question. I'll come to it in just a minute. But I'm still working on the low pricing. As a matter of fact, when you turn into a person that settles for whole food, plant-based, you will reduce your food budget by 35 to 45%. It's a win-win all the way. It's very high in nutrients, particularly phytonutrients. These are the micronutrients that are only found in plant foods. And we believe that there are probably over 100,000 micronutrients that you need to be in good health. You don't need them all, but you need as many of them as you can get. When you take a food supplement, this is not giving you those kind of micronutrients. When you take an orange, you think, well, I got my vitamin C, I can take it in terms of a tablet or something. I have my vitamin C in a tablet form. I don't have time to, to eat that orange this morning. I just take the vitamin C. You're wrong, because there are probably over 100 phytonutrients that are embedded in the orange that activate the vitamin C to work at its optimal level. So we need to go back to the basic foods that we have out there. And of course, they're high in volume because it's high in fiber, and fiber is magical. Fiber is magical. I'll come to it in just a few minutes. Uh, please note that when you have fruits, vegetables, grains, and beans, they're all very, very low in fat. And therefore, they're very low in calories. Well, what about these Fig Newton squares? Well, you know, it's a fat-free little cookie. It's 100 calories. It's not too bad. It's a nice treat, perhaps, for some people. But look at this. You could have eaten a quarter to a half a quant cantaloupe. That's also 100 calories. Which would satisfy you more? Which would give you better phytochemical content? <clears throat> you can have one slice of apple pie. It's a nice thing to have once in a while. Some people enjoy that. On the other hand, you could have had five baked apples. Which would fill you up more? Which would give you more satiety? Which would help you to control your weight better? You can be at a medical convention and you have some of these bourbon there and uh, you know, you don't have very much, you have a few nuts there and it's 740 calories. And you say, well, it's okay. Chances are you go back for a second. So now you have 1,500 calories, right? And when I ask you at the evening, how, did, how was the happy hour? You don't even remember that you had two drinks. But look at this, you could have eaten 740 calories times two, 1,480 calories. You could have eaten 10 pounds of fresh fruit and four bread rolls. What I want to uh, illustrate here is that when you eat foods as grown, you can eat large amounts and the number of calories are small unless you doctor it up. Okay? <clears throat> 
Yeah, there you see my grandson. People always ask me, is he sitting on a, is he sitting on a stove? I said, no, 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 we, we don't do those things. <laughs> now, and people said to me, you mean I can't have a cheeseburger anymore? I said, well, you know, if, if you are not into a total vegetarian lifestyle and you are advocating more raw food, well, maybe you can choose maybe a portobello burger because right there you only have 250 calories instead of 1,000 calories. So try to make some choices. And the point I want to make is here that the principal cause of overweight is not overeating if you eat the right foods. It's the reliance on heavily marketed, calorically dense food. That is the main cause of overweight. The main culprit in overweight then is not food volume, but caloric density. Of course, underlying all of that has to do with attitude, goal setting. What do you really want to get out of life? Are you prepared to set some long-term goals? Are you prepared to do some secondary gratification down the line? Are these foods really that important to you? But if you eat the right foods, look what happens. On the right-hand side, you see this is now a diet where the stomach is filled with fiber-rich food. It doesn't take very many calories, the white spots there, because it's the fiber that gives you a feeling of fullness. And when that happens, when that happens, there are small sensors on the inside of a stomach wall, and they're being activated by the volume that is pushing on the inside walls of the stomach, and a signal is being sent to your brain, to the apostat, I am full, and you shut down. A wonderful mechanism. On the other hand, if you have the typical American diet where only one-fifth the fiber content is to be found, what you should have. Americans get about 10 grams of fiber. We need about 40 to 50 grams. So when you have this fiber-depleted diet on the left-hand side, you can see you have to have more and more calories to eat before you finally get the message to your brain, I am satisfied, I am content, I am full. And so here are the four magical guidelines. Number one, reduce empty calories. You remember? Sugars, refined oils, alcohol. Number two, reduce animal products because they're not in your best interest, in particular for the obese person because of the high content of calories coming from fat. Number three, we talked about the importance of moving towards a diet that is plant-based and whole food. Right? And then number four, we recommend that you get into an exercise program, not because you want to lose weight, but it's just a secondary benefit that comes to you. Let me close now by making the recommendation that if you want to be a winner in the losing game, eat more food. I mean, that's what everybody wants. No restrictions. Just choose carefully what you eat. Eat more and exercise more. But there's one more guideline here, and that is when you have a very, very big person, a person that is 300 pounds, 350 pounds, telling them these kind of principles, it's not going to do it. Because obesity to these people, especially for women that have been abused, that have a high ACE score, ACE, adversarial, childhood, event. Adversive childhood events. People, particularly women, that are very large, that have been abused psychologically or physically and sexually, oftentimes these guidelines don't make much sense because the overriding concern here is the deep pain that has settled deep inside where food becomes now the solution to their problem because when they are well-rounded, they don't have to worry about that somebody might perhaps approach them as it happened in the past. And so when it comes to understanding obesity, it becomes very, very important that we exercise loving care, that we accept the person the way they are, 
but we model for them in kindness our own lifestyle. We are not the food police. We don't tell people, what happens to you if you eat these foods? That has to come from within. We can only extend our loving care and our understanding and help these people to begin to accept themselves of what they are, valuable human beings. And when you do this, then they might have that aha moment where they begin to realize, yeah, my diet is actually not in my best interest. Yes, I can find some help from Dr. Paul in trying to find myself and to learn how to take responsibility for my emotions, how to manage them. And they may recognize, oh yes, the diet that I'm on, it's 50% processed foods. They go in very easily. They're condensed, and I can only eat small amounts, but I can eat large amounts if I enlarge the green slice more. And I begin to eat more foods as grown. Those that don't need nutrition labels or warning labels. And so then, the optimal diet for a person that wants to lose weight would be to focus on a wide variety of whole foods, freely eaten as grown, aim for simple food preparation with sparing use of fats and oils, little sugar and salt, and almost devoid of refined processed foods. And if there are some people that insist that they want to have meat, then let them eat some animal products as seasoning or condiment, and hopefully they begin to learn to get on track in due time. These are the foods that are looking to me very appealing. Lots of water, lots of color, lots of fiber. And how do you best do this? Some people are ready from one day to the next. When they have a heart attack and they have an appropriate, caring, communicating professional, it can happen just like that. That's what Dr. Esselstyn does in five hours. They're ready, they're going for it. They make the change at once. They have no choice. They're too close to the edge. But many people may not always be in that position where they're ready to make the big change. And what we recommend to people is, why don't you start here? If you are the typical American where you eat meats and dairy and eggs and processed foods and alcohol and caffeine, begin to leverage that. Eat less and less and instead replace it with fruits and vegetables, some nuts and seeds. Remember I said some? Legumes, beans, excellent whole grains, and plenty of water. And when you do this, you have a wonderful opportunity of helping people to become winners in the losing game. And when that happens, you see their eyes brightening up. You see the joy comes back into their lives. Hope wells up within. And all of a sudden, you become a happy trooper yourself because you have opened the doors for someone else to be a happy and healthy person. Thank you so much. <laughs> 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 <laughs>